Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. From God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for meditation this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, chapter 4, excuse me, verse 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So far, our text. So Christian friends, if you go to Germany, there is a Lutheran church called the United Evangelical Lutheran Church of Germany. This is the German state church. It's a federation of churches that um, have their doctrine set by the state and also the clergy are paid by tax dollars from the government. And I'd like to introduce you to Gerhard Ulrich. Um, that is the traditional garb of a Lutheran minister in Germany. And uh, even in America, they look like that. I don't know that I'm going to don. It's like a Befkin or something. I forget exactly the name for that. Not wrong. <clears throat> the problem with this guy is that in his Easter message for 2017, Gerhard Ulrich reminded everybody that Jesus' body decomposed and that Jesus is still dead. What he did say was that what was divine about Jesus, his passion for life, his ideals, his zeal, um, those live on. And they live on because the disciples carried his message forward. He was resurrected when the disciples came out of those locked rooms and they weren't afraid of the Jews anymore. And they carried on the message of hope that Jesus offered to the world. Now, the problem is, of course, that this is part of the Christian church. I don't know how they, you could call these people Christian, and yet, uh, if you look at stats, everybody will include them. The resurrection is an interesting topic because um, it, it is very offensive. Some people talk about some things about Christianity that are horrible if you talk to an atheist or someone who has a problem with Christianity, whether it's uh, God's view on homosexuality or God's view, the roles of men and women, God's view on money, God's view on anything. Someone can take offense at that. And finally, I say what's really offensive is the cross. That, one, number one, you're a sinner. and That God had to die for you. And on this Sunday, what's really offensive is the empty tomb. Jesus lives, physically. What would happen if you heard me say on this Sunday that my message is that Jesus is not alive, his body decomposed, he died? I would hope that you guys would confront me in mass at the end of the church service. I would hope that if I said Jesus' body is decomposed and that he's dead, I would hope that you would have the ammunition to realize that I've just denied that Jesus is God's son. If I told you that Jesus is decomposed and dead still in the tomb, that you would say, hang on a second, you just denied that I'm going to rise from the dead. And finally, if I told you that Jesus was decomposed and still dead in the tomb, you would take me aside and say, Pastor Fred, you realize that this message means I'm still in my trespasses and sins. I have a guilty conscience, and I don't know what to do with it. The message of Easter is extremely important and vital. And it's just a reminder, it's very offensive to some people. Easter is kind of a delicate topic, and I'm excited to go through this series because I can take a different tack approaching Easter. The events of Easter are well known, of course. Joseph of Arimathea got the body immediately because it needed to be off the cross before the Sabbath started, Friday at 6 o'clock. With, with the help of Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea put Jesus in his own tomb that had not been used by anybody else and put him in there before 6 o'clock on that Friday. Saturday, 
the chief priests sealed the tomb and got Pilate to assign a guard to the tomb to make sure that nobody messed with it. Sunday morning, sometime between, well, midnight, I suppose, and 6 a.m., when the ladies were on their way, Jesus rose from the dead. When the angel came on Easter morning, there was an earthquake, just because an angel shows up, that's enough reason. The guards fell over and became like dead men. They passed out. The angel rolls the stone away, not because Jesus was knocking on the stone, but because it was already empty. Nowhere else in the Bible except in 1 Peter chapter 3 do we see the doctrine of the descent into hell. We confess it all the time in the creed, and yet this is as good a time as any because this is when it happened on Easter Sunday morning. After Jesus was, was made alive, he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now, what exactly does that mean, the spirits in prison? Well, this is probably hell. This is what we say. Those are the spirits in prison. He descended into hell, and what did he do? Well, this is the best picture I got. Do you, you know what, what the purpose after you win in the Olympics to take your flag and then walk around the stadium while people cheer? The first time I saw that, I'm like, what is he doing? That is a victory lap. I don't know that I'm ever going to get to take one, but Jesus did. After he rose from the dead, the first thing he did was went straight into hell. And I don't know what his message was. It's not recorded for us, but it's probably something similar to you guys lost. All you people who listened to Noah and refused to believe the word that was spoken by him, he was right. I'm alive. And then he comes up. Now, Easter morning is a little confusing as you go through your gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John have a little flock of ladies going to the tomb. John just has Mary Magdalene. It's not that hard to, to harmonize because there are two trips in the synoptic gospels. And then on, the, on that second trip back, it was just Mary who saw Jesus at the empty tomb as the gardener. That's good. Well, he's, same thing with the disciples on that second trip back. Peter and John were there. And then Jesus appeared to even more people. Cleopas and the other disciple on the road to Emmaus. And then in a pack of 500 men, there were probably women and children, but that was all that was counted. There was a huge number of people to whom Jesus showed himself. So there's no doubt in anyone's mind that the resurrection actually happened. Now, there have been other books that were written that there are plenty of eyewitness accounts. And if you just took those accounts and went into a court of law, there would be enough evidence, plenty of evidence, to convict Jesus of being alive. It's true. But now, what's the consequence for you? Easter is kind of a tough holiday to get your finger on because, meh, he died on the cross for my sins. That's the standard answer. Well... He was raised to life for your justification. Let's read the text one more time. Just one verse. He was de delivered over to death for our sins. And he was raised to life for our justification. That dichotomy there, that, if you cut that verse in half, you have Good Friday and Easter laid out for you. Delivered over to death for our sins. That one's easy. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. And he was raised to life for our justification. It is the courtroom de declaration. I don't know how loud it was when that stone was rolled away, but it's a crack that has echoed through time itself that Jesus is alive, and because of that, God is not a liar. God is real. The Son of God exists. Jesus is alive. And because He lives, you also will live. And your sins? Yeah, they were paid on Good Friday, and the proof is Jesus is alive. There was a colleague of mine who was talking to a Muslim man who was dating a Christian in his church. 
And he, very friendly, very friendly. He's more like an American Muslim, if that makes sense. Uh, kind of relaxed, more, you know, eat halal, uh, try to do some of the gloss over stuff, love everybody, alms to the poor, whatever. And he, he thought, isn't Christianity and Islam fairly similar? You know, we both have a prophet, whatever. And, and the pastor said, no, not so much. We have a living prophet. And our prophet isn't just prophet. He's also our God. And everything that Allah demands of you, our God did. Because there's nothing that we can do that's ever good enough. And I don't know that that Muslim was convinced. I don't know how the story ended. I don't know that that pastor ever will either. But that is the power of the resurrection. The first thing you do when somebody comes to you and they're offended about something uh, that is your faith that they have a hard time with? No, no, you misunderstand. What you're really offended over is the empty tomb. You start there, and then you walk your way backwards from anything else, and you have to understand that when I do a Bible information class, I don't start with creation at the beginning. I start with Jesus, and specifically his death and resurrection. Because honestly, the rest are details. And as the Spirit convinces people of these powerful truths, the most important truths, the Spirit convicts, convicts and convinces them of everything else. Because it just falls in line. Because the reality is this is God's Word. And this is what He says. And on this Father's Day weekend, my dad didn't teach me a whole lot about baseball. Tell me a little bit about computers. But we had regular devotions at home. That's the one thing I remember. And as dads, I know it's hard. Just instill that one thing in your children is the value of sitting at the feet of your God and hearing Him speak. That's powerful. And so as you pass that on, even if you're not a dad, that's a valuable trait to have to sit at the feet of God's Word and to pray for dads and encourage them and help other dads as you can where you see them. Dear friends, the resurrection is powerful. And it's also offensive. But that is the proof of our salvation and the guarantee that one day you will live forever. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed found in your worship folder. 